So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, and uh, it's uh, my great honor to open up proceedings. I'm and also my great honor to be uh, chair of the trustees of this wonderful charity. And I can't think of a better place to have this uh, than the Francis Crick Institute, which is really the pinnacle of biomedical sciences in the UK. Now it's been a very challenging time uh, for all charities. And it's wonderful to see you all here finally face to face. Uh, but we as a charity took the uh, road of not stopping, of continuing the work, and in fact, taking advantage of this time <clears throat> to try and rebuild or revitalize aspects of the charity and to develop strategy uh, and new uh, initiatives. And really it has been for us uh, a very busy uh, couple of years. So first of all, we had uh, a direct response to COVID. And the idea there was to try and have health innovations that have come through COVID, um, through the necessities of COVID, uh, to try and use those to improve uh, the treatment of people with epilepsy. We had capacity building. So we have now two new PhD hubs uh, in Newcastle and Edinburgh. Uh, we've had webinars and blogs throughout this period to try and keep our community together and inform people about the research that was going on and engaging people. And importantly, we had our campaign, uh, A Life Interrupted, which um, I'm sure you all will be well aware of. It was a marvelous campaign highlighting really the inequalities in research funding. And for example, it's 21 pounds per year for a person with epilepsy uh, compared to 234 pounds for Parkinson's or over 100 pounds for Alzheimer's. And then there've been other initiatives as well. There's been the SHAPE network, which was really important because this was a way of trying to involve people with epilepsy in directing the epilepsy research that we fund and that takes place within the United Kingdom. And um, with that, we've had a priority setting partnership, uh, which has been involving clinicians, patients, patient bodies, scientists, key patient groups to try and come up with um, the, uh, the messages and the questions that we want to ask um, in the, the next 10, 15 years and what we should be addressing in epilepsy research. We've developed funding partnerships, which has been important uh, during these times uh, with Autistica, Young Epilepsy and the Stroke Association and the Association of British Neurologists. And lastly, but not least, we try to build upon industry partnerships um, and we've had a recent partnership with Angelini Farmer, uh, which has resulted in a major call for data research, uh, which I think is going to be the, one of the futures of health research um, uh, in epilepsy. So it really has been a very busy uh, and uh, a very important time for the charity. And this has not been possible without the clinicians, the scientists, the researchers, um, and also importantly, uh, the donors and those people who support the charity. But most of all, it's been down to the very hard work of, of our staff um, who have been working throughout the uh, pandemic tirelessly uh, from home, with visits to the office. Um, the amount of work they put in just has amazed me. And, and I think I'd like to take this opportunity right at the start to thank them for everything that they've done. Um, and now, uh, with not much more ado, um, it's really time for what you've come to see, which is the, um, uh, the award ceremony and the presentation. So I'd like to welcome uh, Maxine Smeaton, our chief executive, and my cousin, uh, who is chair of our scientific advisory board, to come up for the award ceremony. Thanks very much for that, Matthew. Um, as Matthew has said, uh, this year and actually the last three years over the pandemic have, have been busier than ever in terms of the, the workings of Epilepsy Research UK. In addition to our usual funding streams, we've also had pandemic-led initiatives and also additional capacity building as well. And I'm delighted to say that over the last three years, during this pandemic period, we've actually funded close to 4 million uh, funding research, uh, which I think is a phenomenal achievement. 
It's all difficult to uh, select the best uh, research, and for that, I'm hugely grateful to the scientific, scientific advisory committee for all of their hard efforts over the last few years. These people give their time up voluntarily, and it's to their great credit that here you are funding such high quality science. I also want to thank Priva as well for all her support. So, yes, yeah, so just to say that. We obviously have three years of awards to, to cover. So this is going to be the 2020 annual research awards where we funded 1.3 million pounds of research. So here's a short video of some of the awards. Thanks to our supporters, in 2020, we were able to invest 1.3 million pounds in research projects across the UK, which was the single largest amount we have awarded in almost 30 years of operating. The funding supported 10 projects in total, including three explore pilot studies proposed by Dr. Laura Mantuan Ritter, Professor Richard Baines, and Dr. Simon Keller. Four Endeavour project grants were awarded to Dr. Khalid Hamandi, Professor Mike Cousin, Professor Matthew Walker, and Dr. Sophie Bennett. Our 2020 Emerging Leader Fellows were Dr. Wessel Waldman and Dr. Charlotte Tai, whose project was co funded by our charity partners, Autistica. And finally, the first ever Celine Newman bursary was awarded to Professor Andrew Trevelyan. These projects covered a range of promising and fascinating areas of research, including the characterization of a new anti-epileptic drug, non-invasive brain mapping of epileptic activity, and revolutionary breath testing and sweat analysis to aid accurate diagnosis. Dr. Charlotte Tai discussed her fellowship project here. In this study, I will track the brain and behavioural development of infants with epilepsy over the first two years of life using baby-friendly methods in the family home. By identifying differences in brain development that predict outcomes, this research will inform approaches to early interventions to improve longer-term quality of life. Thank you very much to the supporters of Epilepsy Research UK and Autistica for making this research possible. Congratulations to all our 2020 awardees. Well, yeah, there's some fantastic research in there. And actually, having read the grant reports, uh, because obviously these have been ongoing, uh, there's already been a lot of really important data generated. So without further ado, we can move straight on to 2021. In 2021, we awarded funding to four new projects, all of which aimed to capacity build the epilepsy research environment and develop the next generation of researchers. Our overall investment for this year was also £1.3 million. Dr. Gareth Morris was awarded the Emerging Leader Fellowship for his project using microRNA biosignatures as sensors for precision gene therapy. Dr. Tim Tierney was awarded the Joint Epilepsy Research UK and Young Epilepsy Fellowship for his project aiming to make bedside brain imaging a reality. 2021 also saw the launch of the Epilepsy Research UK Doctoral Training Centres, which will support the development of future researchers in epilepsy. Each of these PhD hubs will train at least six students who are currently being recruited. Professors Cathy Abbott and Richard Chin will lead a centre at the University of Edinburgh, and Professor Andrew Trevelyan and Dr. Rhys Thomas will oversee the Newcastle University Centre. Dr. Thomas explains more here. In terms of for people with epilepsy, we've got some PhD programmes that are going to join existing bodies of work. So for example, some of the neuroengineering, looking at optogenetics, that's really the next stage of that is to go into a human trial. And you know that's going to be really exciting. As opposed to some of the other work is a little bit more speculative. The skills that you gain from doing that work is going to be something that we're going to be able to export as well as the outcome. Congratulations to our 2021 awardees. So one of the things that we've done over the course of the last couple of years is to really start a conversation between researchers and our supporters. And we've done that in a number of ways. Through the SHAPE network, network, we've developed formal relationships through application clinics and helping us sort of develop our strategy around um, uh, involving people in research. And we've also done it informally through um, thematic um, webinar series. So it's been really lovely to bring that community together. So we thought, what better way to acknowledge that relationship than asking some of our supporters to present the awards tonight. So I don't know who's more nervous, them or me. I'm, I'm not good up here either. So, so let's just go with it. So um, it, it's been wonderful to watch everybody come together because we've derived so much, so many benefits from, um, from doing that work. But what I really want to do is just to thank them all so sincerely for everything that they've done through lockdown. 
people didn't stop. I know research centers didn't stop, they're not really, but they just really didn't. They kept going. They made just the most creative um, fundraising activities and did everything that they could to, con you know, to continue supporting us. So we're, we're so grateful for that. We really, really are. And, um, and I, I think about us as a community, and I know people tend to love the community word, but I really <laughs> believe that about us because I think that um, our, um, the researchers and all the people that work with us to, to go above and beyond is incredible. So um, people like our scientific advisor committee, I know that you, you acknowledge them, but it's a lot of work sets in all those ones, a lot of work, and they really, really take it seriously, multiple meetings, so many documents to read and assess and contribute. And our board, as much as I don't like to acknowledge them, <laughs> and, um, and then there's people who gift their skills, um, people like Andy Peoples, who you'll meet later on, they just gift us their knowledge and expertise. So we, we really, really are a community. And um, my message to researchers tonight are that, you know, we as a community, community are banking on you. People give their money because they live in hope that you're going to really um, develop the next, um, the take us on our ne the next step of our journey to a life even that legacy. So no pressure, guys. <laughs> so just thank you all for coming. Um, so the um, the first um, award that we're going to make tonight is um, to all our project grants. And we're going to bring you all up together so that you don't have to suffer the humiliation of the individual um, things. And um, I'm absolutely delighted that um, um, Farnell, who are a long term supporter, they've been supporting a corporate partnership that we've had for over 20 years. They've been absolutely amazing. We, we, you're incredible. Golf, golf days, donations from the um, corporate office in the States. And then even through lockdown, we made these, all these creative. Um, virtual cycles across to their head office in the state. So I'm really thrilled to announce that um, Rob is here to present the award tonight. So thank, thank you, Rob, for that. So Rob is going to read out the name of the, um, the awards. And if you don't mind all coming up, and um, we'll give you lots of cheers and probably you know, a little bit of whooping as you come up. And, uh, and then we'll take your photographs and Okay, and if, if I could, I know this is off the piece, yeah. but um, the reason I'm here is um, actually, I'm delighted to meet my CEO, so I hope he's not embarrassed by this, but John Hurst hired me over 20 years ago to work at uh, Barnell. It followed a tragedy, so he lost his son. Um, I didn't hear from him for three months, so I thought I could get a job. Um, and then I found out about the fact that he lost his son on a cycling holiday. Black Forest in Germany. And as a result, his company set up not just a golf day, but also we went through COVID. We ran a series of events, uh, which my business team here uh, organized. And uh, I'm really delighted to, I'm honored actually to be here to be able to uh, present these awards to these fabulous uh, people that are continuing their research. So uh, without further ado, if I can ask up the stage, Dr. Sophie Adler, Dr. Jonathan Lindgast, Dr. Sophia Wright, and Dr. Rob Weiss. I can't remember how many grant applications we had, but I think it was in the region about 75. <laughs> So we haven't excluded Karen Smiley, she just wasn't able to make it. <laughs> Here we go. So these supporters are not going to thank me for their interest, but um, I'm absolutely delighted to announce, um, to, to uh, welcome uh, Joyce and Chris, two of the most amazing supporters that we've got. So tenacious, it's incredible. So um, please, please come up to the stage and I'll abuse you if you can ask it. <laughs> From the uh, photographs, Joyce does the most amazing from running to cheering at events to hosting incredible balls, which we're all very jealous of. And um, Chris, who's made a, an absolute habit of ultra uh, uh, ultra events and also um, creating your own fundraising products. I think you're after our jobs, you know. So <laughs> no, no one in Wiltshire has been safe from the golf school in time, which I think is yeah, fair to say. So, so just finished that season there, we've raised another 5,000 for the Amazing. 
you'd like to fire away. Okay, okay. <laughs> you're pleased to announce the first Emerging Leader Fellowship Award this evening goes to Dr. Catherine Bush of Newcastle University. So this project is all about understanding and preventing health inequalities in epilepsy in the United Kingdom. Health inequalities are the systematic, unjust and unfair differences between the health of different groups within our population. And we know that in epilepsy there are two major health inequalities. The first is that people with epilepsy die at a younger age on average than those that don't have it. The second is that people who live in the most deprived areas of the United Kingdom are more than twice as likely to have epilepsy than those that live in the least deprived. And what we don't understand at the moment is why those differences occur. So this research really aims to use population level health data to look at those differences and try and understand them. So I think there's a fantastic quote by Desmond Tutu which really summarises what we're trying to achieve here. What he said is that there comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. Once we have designed and modelled interventions to try and reduce the health inequalities in epilepsy, we want to use this information and we really want to use it to change the way that people think about epilepsy. What we want to do is raise the profile of epilepsy and we want to influence the people who make decisions about healthcare policy and strategy in the United Kingdom. We want epilepsy to become a priority for those people and we want them to prioritise reducing health inequalities and improving the health of people with epilepsy. I'm aware that this funding has come from a generous donation from the late Evan Stone and I'd just like to say a ginormous thank you to Evan and his family for supporting this research. I don't, I don't even know how to describe these next two supporters. Um, double trouble, I think, probably. Is the um, uh, Dawn and Bridget, um, their energy is just, it's, it's exhausting, thank you. Um, you know, there's a Dawn with her mid-winter swims and, uh, and the hair, not, let, let's not forget the hair dye challenge. I know, I know I'll be in lots of trouble for mentioning that. And then there's Bridget, not only is she organising festivals, but she's running marathons all around the world. So um, I'd like to welcome you welcome to the stage. So there's always <laughs> I'll be in trouble for that one. We're <laughs> pleased to announce in the second American Leader Fellowship Award season goes to Dr. Amal Bandari of the University of Warwick. Let's hear it up to work. <laughs> My research project will help to understand the function of non-neuronal brain cells, the microglia, in drug resistant seizure, memory dysfunction, and sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Now, what are microglia? Microglia are the immune cells of the central nervous system and they act like a security system. Microglia continuously scan brain to keep eye on any kind of danger to protect neurons. Now, during seizure, neurons become active and they activate microglia, which produces neuroinflammatory molecules and again, they eat branches of neuron called as the synapses. I will use advanced in vivo imaging technique to understand how microglia become beneficial or harmful during different phases of epilepsy. This will allow us to use currently available drug minocycline which inhibits microglial activation into clinical trial to provide benefits to the people with epilepsy in a very short span of time. Finally, I would like to send my sincere thank you to Bruce Tucker family who made this research funding possible and their generous support for this fellowship. And our, our next supporters, um, Rachel and Nick, are father and daughter team, and um, li quite literally uh, the dream team. They've, they've been absolutely incredible. I know, Rachel, you won't mind me sharing this story if you haven't had surgery, successful surgery. And I think what's been really interesting is that you had this surgery, it transformed your life. And 
and um, there was research that sort of underpinned all that work. And you just haven't stopped giving back since. And um, we just want to salute you and, you know, everything from running, cycling, in fact, you did the marathon for us this year. And um, Nick cycled all over Europe and um, even did the BBC Radio 4 appeal for us. So, yeah, so you're much treasured supporters. So thank you. Thank you. We are pleased to announce that the final Emerging Leader Fellowship Award to the University. So, one in 2,000 children um, are born with epilepsy, and this can be the result of misspellings, um, basically, or errors in a single gene. Um, and in most of these cases, we don't really know why or how these faulty genes cause epilepsy. Um, and it's highly likely that these faulty genes are likely to be occurring early on before birth. But obviously it's very difficult to study these early developmental stages. To try and investigate this further, I have developed a system whereby I've been able to uh, take small portions of uh, developing brain tissue and uh, study this in the laboratory. These samples are donated from a very special biobank here in Newcastle called the Human Developmental Biology Resource. I will use these samples to be able to assess how the faulty genes are um, affecting early brain development in human fetal tissue. So I'm going to use this uh, new approach that I've been developing here in Newcastle and I will alter genes that are associated with epilepsy and see what effect this has on the developing brain. And this is really exciting because I think we'll be able to look at um, the underlying cause of this disorder but also a major advantage of this model is that it's highly adaptable so we can use this to investigate multiple different genes that are associated with epilepsy. The, the, the most immediate impact this will have is that for families and people with um, variants, for example, in STXBP1, we'll be able to give clarification um, and understanding for the uh, mechanisms that, um, underlying the disease, essentially. Um, and I think that's crucial for them being able to go on to understand the, the next treatment options that we will, will go on to study. But um, to be honest, I think the, that's only going to be the start because the, the next five to ten years uh, beyond that, I think, is where we're really going to see the impact of this model system because I'm now starting to prove its value with this particular gene of interest. But as I mentioned before, it's got a highly adaptable um, nature that we can actually look at multiple genes of interest. So I want to go on to look at many genes and then also use it as a platform to see whether we can actually um, reverse any of the effects that we observe or even just to, to use it as a screening tool for multiple drugs that are being developed at the moment to treat epilepsy. Before we go to the next awards, I'd just like to say um, just congratulations to researchers. I mean, um, receiving a fellowship from that works research is, uh, is career changing and all these fantastic projects. So uh, thank you so much. We really look forward to working with you. Um, the final award tonight um, is being presented by Gordon and Jill Perry. Perry. How did I get your name? <laughs> so, um, we've known um, Gordon and Jill for three decades now. And uh, we pulled up some of the old photos to embarrass him. Um, they had legendary status in the Hawaiian area through um, all these incredible walks that you run every year. And um, I hear somebody's called the film like this. Um, but you yeah, know, we just want you to come up to the stage tonight and present our next award. So, as you'd expect from me, there is no award. It's, a, it's, it's an absolute risk to just get you up on stage and, uh, and to just say an absolute heartfelt thanks from us all for three decades of uh, fundraising for us. And we know you've raised a phenomenal amount of money. And um, we just want you to know how much we appreciate it. And I know that you want us to take a step back from the um, from managing the um, event, uh, managing the walk. So, we just kind of think now's the time to just for us to just say. But all the time, if you had to do it again, you know, you do it again and again and again. Um, because, you know, I used to feel that wherever the cure 
if it was at the top of Everest, I would get there. And I know Gordon felt the same. You do anything, anything at all to find that, that uh, help and cure for them. Yeah, that's what you do. There always was hope and there is still that for those people who um, are suddenly um, struck with it or, and people are dealing with it every day. Um, I know there are different kinds of epilepsies and I know it's going to take time and I know it takes a lot of funding but um, that's what we hope for. And what mm -hmm. our hope is that no one anywhere would have to go through what we've been through. Mm. You, you've given so much to us and, and actually bigger than that to epilepsy research in general. So we just wanted to commemorate you know, you, you reaching such a huge milestone and for being such incredible supporters. I'm meeting two lovely ladies. Oh, well, well that, obviously that's your treat. Look at that. It says, Jill and Gordon, in recognition of your outstanding contribution to epilepsy research, May 2021. Can't read English, you know. I know. That's it. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, well, now I'm lost for words now. Bye, Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. No, it's Thank you. For pride yeah. of place. Okay, so I'll be having a shot of vodka over here once we <laughs> move to the next. So thank you, everybody. So I'd just like to reiterate our thanks to Jill and Gordon, and also uh, congratulations to all those uh, researchers. And you can see the depth and breadth of research that we are funding, and it's really quite impressive um, and very impressive uh, young people taking part in this research. And a lot of them really are uh, the uh, professors and researchers of the future, and it's great to see. Um, and it's wonderful to really um, introduce somebody who is uh, one of the most uh, eminent uh, pediatric cardiothoracic surgeons and transplant surgeons um, at Great Ormond Street uh, to come and give uh, the next talk. Um, he's a phenomenal person, as I'm sure you'll understand when you hear his talk. Uh, he's retired from Great Ormond Street, but that hasn't uh, stopped him from continuing to do uh, amazing work um, as non-executive director of the Royal Marsden NHS, um, as chief medical officer of Allocate uh, Software, uh, and also um, non-executive non director of Children's Health at Ireland Dublin. And also, impressively, he was a member of the China Tribunal, and I'd recommend that you all go and speak to him afterwards to find out about uh, mm -hmm. that. Um, so, without much more ado, it's uh, wonderful for you to give up your time, and it's uh, really looking forward to your talk, uh, Professor Martin Elliott. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much, Malcolm. Thank, thank you, everybody. Um, it's a, a real honour for me to be here, and a privilege. <coughs> It's also a bit shit scary actually standing in the cricket stand. <laughs> where proper scientists live, and as a surgeon with hairy knuckles, you can imagine how I feel. Um, I wanted to talk about the the difference really between my experience um, with heart and heart research and what's happening in epilepsy. And I start with quite a lot of bias because I've spent um, my life operating on the hearts of babies like these. It's what I loved, it's what I found out I could do, and it took up most of my time, probably my wife would say all of my time. Um, at least until my life and that of my family changed suddenly uh, and dramatically when on Friday the 13th, of course, 2009, my son Toby died suddenly at home during the night. Uh, we say now he, he woke up then. He was 26, apparently well, 
who was a film editor at NBC News. And a, a year earlier, during what he told us was a nightmare, he'd bitten his tongue. And he bit his tongue the night before he died. A post-mortem told us that he died of sudden death in epilepsy. Actually, in retrospect, I'm not sure how they worked that out from the post-mortem. But neither I nor any of the five professors of medicine who were present at Toby's funeral had ever heard of Sudo. We didn't know it existed. And we weren't alone. Only a third of Canadian pediatricians in 2011 working with children with epilepsy had ever heard of Sudo. How can that be? Now, um, I'll leave you to read this definition, excellent definition from Lena Nasher. But what matters is that in England and Wales, 600 young people are dying of sort of every year. And that's probably an underestimate because the post-mortem reports are pretty lousy and diagnosing it at post-mortem isn't great. Now, I'm a cardiac surgeon spent my life looking after the heart, and I know much more about sudden cardiac death, which has a similar number of deaths in England and Wales per year. That means between sudden cardiac and sudden death in epilepsy, we're losing a couple of thousand people a year to these two conditions, at least. That's an awful lot of classrooms, lecture theatres, nightclubs. Now, why is it then the same distribution, same terrible mortality that occurs, that heart funding for research gets you know, such an enormous difference between that and at least 10 times difference between that and epilepsy? And if you just look at the research for sudden death, it's still twice as much for the heart as for epilepsy. Why should that be? Well, a lot of it is because it carries a stigma. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, people with epilepsy were shoved into um, houses and asylums. They were ostracized from society, kept out of public gaze. In London at the Bethlehem, in the Ohio Hospital in Chicago, worldwide. And the stigma remains. This is a psychologist called Sally Baxter who so the stigma remains worse than the seizures for many families. The other problem with the difference between sudden cardiac death and sudden death in epilepsy is that they take place or tend to take place at different times of the day. With sudden cardiac death taking place during the day and sudden classically or more frequently at night. So for sudden cardiac death often happens during the day, it's witness. It's often filmed in the modern era. Everybody's got a cell phone. And there's very often an ECG taken from the defibrillator that's um, taken out. That's what happened to Christian Eriksson at the Euros in 2020. Uh, without the same success to poor Samuel just a couple of weeks ago in Nottingham. These get into the papers. If it leads, it leads and it's easy to photograph and the evidence is strong. For Sudha, they often take place at night. For example, in a student flat like this one. Alone, maybe away from home. And this creates a problem for both families and science because the body may not be found for some time. And there are, in, in, you know, in Toby's age group, so 20 to 34, the causes of death are largely suicide or drug overdose. So that alters the way in which people approaching someone who's had a sudden event at night approach the problem. So that same scene suddenly becomes a crime scene. For many families, it's not a, a place of tragedy, but becomes a, a, a crime scene with police separating the loved ones from the victim, looking for evidence of foul play or suicide <coughs> or drugs. It's hugely stressful, and for obvious reasons, it rarely reaches the media. 
in a way which might be helpful to us wanting to make a difference. Now, interestingly, uh, there are mechanisms in common to both causes of sudden death, and they may overlap and they may help elucidate both cause and treatment. Some of the projects you've heard about have clear overlap here. Now, in both the brain and the heart, electrical signals are passed from cell to cell as a means of communication. The membrane polarity between positive and negative across the cell changes as sodium, calcium, and potassium ions flux across that membrane, creating a little spike which can be passed from one cell to the other. If the process goes wrong, abnormal rhythms or abnormal communications or abnormal exchanges of signals can occur. And underlying that, there's a whole bunch of mechanisms which are far too complicated to talk about, especially in this building, where scientists will strike me down with lightning if I get anything. <laughs> um, but the abnormalities exist in these little channels which move ions backwards and forwards uh, called channelopathies, each of which, or some of which, have a defined genetic basis, as you've heard. And those working in the field estimate that there's a bit of an overlap between sudden cardiac death and sudden death in epilepsy of around 20% of overlapping functional abnormality. But there's a final common pathway to death, sadly, in both of these things very commonly, and that's ventricular fibrillation. So those of you familiar with how the heart beats, because you can feel your own pulse, will know that it squeezes and squeezes out a lump of blood which flows around your body and you can feel its pulse. If the heart rhythm changes, then the pulse changes, it becomes irregular. But with ventricular fibrillation, it's just like a bag of worms. No blood is ejected from this heart, and so no oxygen, no food gets to any other part of the body, including the brain, and you shut down and die, unless you are defibrillated. Now, the, in epilepsy, either simple epilepsy or multiple zigzag status epilepsy, which itself can induce a, a, a cardiac problem, a cardiac rhythm change or the underlying problems which occur in stable epilepsy that might happen, so intense seizure or clusters of things, uh, changes to your anti-epileptic drugs, or underlying problems in genetics, might themselves influence parts of the brain, which I'm more familiar with, which involve how the lungs and the heart work. And that can occur because you don't breathe so well, you shut down your breathing, you shift the distribution of blood, or you become, um, you just don't breathe enough. That can happen in both chronic epilepsy and in status. And the end is that you end up with a low blood oxygen or not ventilating enough on a high CO2, both of which can then precipitate a cardiac rhythm change as well, causing VF and death. So that same cascade of events can end up in the same way. And the heart, we can do stuff to find out what's going on quite easily. So there's a couple of causes here. One where um, the muscle of the heart here, and the way out is swollen and it blocks the way out of the heart, um, uh, uh, called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or you can have inflammatory changes in the heart called myocarditis, <coughs> or the rhythm pathways in the heart can be disturbed. Um, we're lucky we can study the heart quite easily using an ECG, stressed by exercise or sometimes doing a structural MRI at the same time to find out much more about it. And we can have a look at how the heart's beating with an echocardiogram just by putting a probe on the surface of the skin. And nowadays, uh, we can look for abnormal genes and we can look for problems in the metabolome as well to look more closely at what's going on in that particular organ. Screening. Well, the problem is screening, screening is not cheap. Um, screening US athletes, which is compulsory in pro sport in America, um, costs up to a billion dollars per year, which is an awful lot more than they spend trying to sort out other causes. But we know why they want to screen them, so they don't have a cardiac arrest and they don't lose the valuable player, but it doesn't get us any closer to working on what's going on. But we have effective treatments as well in, in, um, in the heart. So we can, uh, especially if ventricular fibrillation is the final pathway, we can use one of these things, which is an implantable defibrillator. 
just like a pacemaker that gives you a big shock when it detects PF. And this is what Christian Eriksen had fitted and allowed him to come back to play for Brentford and possibly for Tottenham next year if the transfer deal goes through. <laughs> What's good about this is that there's at least a 50% reduction in mortality if an implantable defibrillator is fitted. So something to detect the rhythm change, something to fire an electric shot in the heart and potentially reverse the problem. Wouldn't it be nice if we had something like that in epilepsy? But the problem is the risk factors for epilepsy aren't so clear cut as they are uh, for SUDA, aren't so clear cut as they are for me dealing with uh, a sudden death in the heart. Um, some of these nighttime sleep and chrome uh, uh, remain controversial. The rapid changes to drug regimen and uh, early diagnosis, undiagnosed fits, remain a risk. And there are far fewer tools for prevention of sudden death and epilepsy than in sudden cardiac death at the moment. Even regular <coughs> review is challenging. Um, I, I sit on another organization where I was working with some GPs and I was shocked to discover that they were paid to see people with epilepsy once a year. And for the last two years, where QOF, which is what the program's called, has been suspended, they haven't been seen at all. Primary care support for epilepsy is in a bad state. Now, much work has gone on to, in this field to try and detect a seizure about to happen. And you all know these things, you've probably seen them much more often than I have, lots of devices. <laughs> I personally have a great fondness for these things, um, which have a wonderful nose. And I'm fascinated that support dogs, some well-trained support dogs can detect a seizure about to happen 40 minutes in advance, wake somebody up, tip them out of bed, or go and fetch a relative, or even make a phone call, which seems stolen to me. I can't even work my phone, so I can <laughs> but, um, it does make you think that in a few years' time we might have a computer nose, you know, that would be able to detect some of these things. And that happens with COVID. We found that with COVID, that you dogs can identify COVID, but they've now trained a sensor which can identify COVID on the computer as well. So um, the problem is we, we're a bit more focused. There's a lot more money gone into cardiac research. And, um, some of the genes have been identified but earlier than been happening in epilepsy. But it sort of remains multifactorial. And as Sanjay said, it's, it's really hard to find a final common pathway. There is no single gene. There's a lot of genes. And there's a sort of imbalance between lots of genetic variants, which are deleterious, and the less deleterious balance of genes on the, on the general population side. The only way you can do this is to do more research and dig down deeper into the genome. Now, um, pseudo victims often, usually, have a postmortem, sometimes an inquest. And we found the whole process completely unsatisfactory, slow, poorly communicated, and ice cold. For others, it's much worse as the delays can be extreme since the um, quality of postmortems and the delays in postmortems vary dramatically from place to place. There's a postcode lottery in how it works. I don't think that's right. Um, we need good data. You're going to hear more about data later. Data is the key to all this. And there should be structured data collection. The uh, Royal College of Pathologists have told us what to do. They've said, call in the clever people, the people who know about epilepsy, and find out a bit more about what's going on at the postmortem. <laughs> if you're unlucky enough, as many are, sort of, to have to go to an inquest, the inquest is to determine the cause of death. Now, I, in my scientific naivety, I thought they might be doing something useful but actually they want to put you in a box called natural causes and exclude murder and suicide. There is little science. I'm still working on the coroners to try and change that. 
but it's a slow process. It's a legally driven process. Natural causes is enough for that. Looking at both these causes of death, I think that we can make some statements, and I believe this strongly, that we should standardize the investigation of all settlements. I've listed it here, but the, you can see that the commitment to research is philosophically the most important thing I think we can do. We need a biobank where tissue from all of these people were unfortunate enough to have landed up in this position can be stored for future use. And we need access to specialist services, not GPs who will see them once a year. And we need to sort this imbalance of funding out. Um, it's not enough to give a dribble of money to epilepsy and a lot of money to stuff because people die during the day. They still die, the families are still affected, the consequences are the same. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, Jane Hanna described Sudep as deaths in the shadows and made this day. It was under-recognized, under-reported, and poorly investigated. But I'm going to challenge not the first, but the second, and say it's under-recognized, under-reported, but increasingly investigated. Uh, um, we miss Toby every day. Uh, all the things you wish you could or should have said, stay with you always. But the lost opportunities for the person who dies, for Toby, really hurt. Toby loved politics. He hated injustice, unfairness, and war. And in fact, when he died, he was editing a documentary for the charity War Child. It seems completely unbelievable to me that he didn't experience 2016 or Brexit or Trump or Partygate. <laughs> that he wasn't there to shout at Trump on TV, which he undoubtedly did. <laughs> and the behavior of Putin and his troops would really have horrified him. I think of him every day. We miss his infectious laugh. And that would have been triggered by the satire which came from all of those terrible things we've lived through in the last few years. Uh, so I want to thank you for listening. And please remember that it is your generosity that can and will make change for families and individuals and all of those who've been through the terrible horrors that these surprises can spread on you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Martin. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to follow that. Um, absolutely tour to force is what the problem is. Um, but I think my role now for the next few minutes or so is to explain why we are moving forward and why the time is right to make a difference. I stand here not only as um, president of Epilepsy Research UK, but also as president of the International League Against Epilepsy, the global organization that um, represents all professionals um, working uh, with individuals with epilepsy or caring for individuals with epilepsy. And we cover, um, we have member chapters in excess of, um, in 128 countries of the world. So we, we see epilepsy from many different perspectives. But in order to explain where we have got to, particularly with regard to the WHO Intersectorial Global Action Plan, I need to start with a bit of history, not least the fact that the International League Against Epilepsy has been working with the WHO and the International Bureau for Epilepsy for many years, probably started in earnest in 1997, 25 years ago. And I'm delighted that Ted Reynolds, who was the president of the International League Against Epilepsy at the time, is here as they started the global campaign against epilepsy to bring epilepsy out of the shadows. Over the years, there has been tireless campaigning in order to improve awareness, improve um, various actions that could, and especially with collaboration with WHO, can improve the awareness and care for individuals with epilepsy throughout the world. Not least, arriving in 2015, <clears throat> with the um, acknowledgement of the World Health Assembly Resolution on the Global Burden of Epilepsy, 
And ultimately, in 2020, the WHO uh, adopting the um, uh, resolution 73.1 calling for the development of an intersectorial global action plan for epilepsy and other neurological disorders. And for this, with acceptance in November 2020, there would be proposed a draft and a proposal this year to establish that 10 year global action plan for epilepsy and other neurological disorders to address multiple gaps, inclusion needs, and the need for research, establish ambitious and achievable targets, the ability to assess progress, and alongside that, to create a technical report on epilepsy. Now, I'm not going to here go through the whole uh, draft global action plan that was developed over the last year and was then subsequently passed by the WHO and their executive in January. And hopefully, as it moves to the WHA, the World Health Assembly next week, it will be rubber stamped and will be accepted. But what this um, slide emphasizes is that there are a series of objectives to this action plan. It is a 10 year action plan. And very specifically, even though it is epilepsy and other neurological disorders, there is one objective that is dedicated to epilepsy. Objective five, which looks at access to services for epilepsy and engagement and support for people with epilepsy. As part of our um, campaigning for this, the International League Against Epilepsy did come up with epilepsy 90, 80, 70 that we felt were realistic targets that could be achieved over the next 10 years. 90% of all people with epilepsy being aware of their diagnosis as a treatable brain disorder, 80% of people with epilepsy having access to appropriate, affordable and safe anti-seizure medications, and 70% of those treated achieving adequate seizure control. That seems straightforward. It's not there at the present time. And this has an impact for other neurological conditions. It's not only for epilepsy. <laughs> not least with the 90% of people being aware of their diagnosis, raised awareness about epilepsy and neurological disorders enhanced diagnostic capacity, key myths busted, 80% of people with epilepsy having access to appropriate uh, medicines, making sure that the WHO has, um, that all uh, on their essential medicines list are appropriate anti-seizure medications, that the supply chain is appropriate. There is reduced barriers with regard to chronic care, and also appropriate um, national formulas and budget for that formulary. And also with regards to 70% of those treated having an adequate seizure control, continuity of care, patient empowerment, and increased research. There is, has been a long um, a, a acknowledged gap in the um, uh, funding for research in epilepsy. In the bottom corner, there is a graph with regards to the percentage of overall NIH funding in the United States in selected research areas. That on the far left is HIV, that on the far right is epilepsy. And this was in 2019, published in the Epilepsy Global Report, again, um, written by the ILEE, the IBE, and of course the WHO. But I hear many people say to me, even though this is a global action plan, what difference is it going to make? Surely this is really targeted at resource poor countries. That's where the WHO is really interested. Is it really going to make a difference in resource rich countries? For that, I go to the um, IGAP on dementia that was launched in 2017. What the IGAP will do, it will commit member states of the WHO to reporting on progress in achieving the objectives in that global action plan. And an interim report will have to be published as this was in the, with regard to dementia in 2000, um, uh, uh, this year. And essentially demonstrating each country had to report back on how they were determining those numbers with regards to dementia and how much resource was being put into achieving the objectives with regard to the global action plan. And one thing that is quite clear is that the monies that have gone into research for dementia have increased phenomenally alongside the duration of time that this global action plan has been in place. We have reached a tipping point. There are many initiatives, not least this, 
that mean that we really should make action now and move forward in increasing the amount of money is going to research as we move forward, we can really make a difference to people with epilepsy. Thank you. We are at a tipping point. We have heard this evening how momentum is building. It is now time to take action. Everyone here knows all too well what is at stake. Epilepsy is one of the most prevalent, serious neurological conditions with around one in every 100 people in the UK living with the condition. That's 65 million people worldwide. The NHS spends around £2 billion every year on epilepsy services. But the cost to the health systems extends beyond seizures due to the rate of misdiagnosis, delayed diagnosis and unplanned hospital admissions due to injury. And it's not just healthcare. The economic impact of epilepsy encompasses education, employability and significant comorbidities such as neurodevelopmental disorders, anxiety and depression. Despite the number of people living with a condition, research into epilepsy receives only 7% of neurological research funding. Just 0.3% of the total £4.8 billion spent on health-related research. This is disproportionately less than other neurological conditions, including diseases such as Parkinson's and dementia. Research funding compared to the number of people affected by epilepsy is an unbalanced equation. Inequalities in research funding for epilepsy has meant progress has been slow. The number of people living with epilepsy is not reducing. Current drug therapies don't work for everyone. 30% of people are living with uncontrolled seizures and shockingly there are still 21 epilepsy related deaths a week. But we are at a tipping point. There are currently shifts in awareness and initiatives we need to leverage right now. Last month, revised NICE guidelines for epilepsy were released with recommendations where more research is needed. In the autumn, Epilepsy Research UK will publish the top 10 research priorities of the UK Epilepsy Priority Setting Partnership. The Once in a Generation programme was developed through a rigorous methodology involving the entire epilepsy community. People affected by epilepsy and people working in epilepsy, from clinicians right through to patient groups. But the most pivotal development will be the publishing of the World Health Organization's Intersectoral Global Action Plan on Epilepsy, the WHO IGAP. Once the IGAP has been published, governments around the world will be tasked with responding to the recommendations, potentially bringing about real change in policy and practice. We need to be prepared and positioned to hold the UK government responsible for implementing the key research recommendations. We will show them how to do it, we will provide the roadmap for delivery. The time is now. As a community, we need to demand more for the next generation. The next generation of people affected by epilepsy. The next generation of researchers developing innovations in epilepsy treatments and care. We need to bring everyone together to end epilepsy. We are today announcing plans to radically advance research into epilepsy. We will demand the government commits to a research investment of £100 for everyone living with epilepsy. That's 100 for every one in 100. A one-off accelerator investment of £60 million in total. To demonstrate to the government the impact this investment would have, we are launching a national epilepsy research collaborative to identify, prioritise and deliver a programme that will drive research breakthroughs resulting in radically improved diagnostics, treatments and prevention. We will place people affected by epilepsy front and centre of a strategic communications campaign to raise awareness of the impact of epilepsy and how research funding will bring about a radical change within a generation. Everyone ending epilepsy. We'd like to introduce you to the team behind the ambition. Three of the UK's leading clinician researchers are programme directors. We are at a tipping point. We need to leverage the published evidence to affect the change so urgently needed to drive greater investment in epilepsy research. If we don't act now, the opportunity cost would be enormous. 
whilst we're doing our best to understand the biology underpinning the epilepsies and develop new treatments, there is so much that we can do to improve the quality of care uh, that people with epilepsy receive and to diminish the health inequalities that are associated with epilepsy. I mean, one great example is the use of routinely collected data uh, that, that is available using our health informatics expertise. We can investigate uh, what is uh, causing our uh, health inequalities, impairing people's ability to access the services uh, that they so readily need. And we desperately need the community to come together so that we can deliver that much needed research to improve the lives of people with epilepsy. By uniting funders, people affected by epilepsy and expert researchers, we will be able to catapult innovations in research that have the potential to be delivered within a generation. This programme will be nothing without the involvement of people affected by epilepsy. We are immensely proud to introduce you to our campaign leaders. I lost my sister to epilepsy and the grief is unimaginable. We would love to prevent this from happening to other families like ours, but there are still 21 epilepsy related deaths every week. That's why we're demanding the government invest £100 for every one in 100 people living with epilepsy. It takes a multidisciplinary team to deliver the best possible care for my children. The same applies to research. Everyone needs to work together to accelerate the translation of research from the lab bench to the hospital bedside. It is also essential that the voice of the patient, family and carers is at the centre of all our collaborations. As an active member of the Valfreight Stakeholders Network, I've seen firsthand how the combination of research and campaigning can bring about a change in healthcare policy and practice. Together, we have the power to transform the lives of people with epilepsy. People like me. This work starts here, today, with all of us. In the coming months, we'll be meeting with clinicians, researchers, funders and epilepsy patient groups throughout the UK. We will seek to understand the shortfalls and challenges that need to be urgently addressed in order to build the capacity of the research environment and most importantly, fast track research into epilepsy. For example, we are already acutely aware urgent investment is required in areas such as data infrastructure. We've seen how this works in other disease areas and the revolution it has brought about in treatments and care. It will be areas such as this that we will focus on to drive the systematic and strategic change so urgently needed. Following stakeholder engagement, we will workshop the challenges identified. We will then publish a set of fully scoped and costed themes and a collaborative roadmap for delivery. Equipped by the underpinning policy changes and our action plan, in partnership with people affected by epilepsy, we will go to government and demand our equitable share of research funding. The time is now for everyone to come together to end epilepsy. To drive this programme, we are delighted to announce Angie Pullen will join us as programme lead. Angie has worked at the forefront of epilepsy for the last 11 years as a Director of Epilepsy Action and Healthcare and Programme Lead. Angie is known and respected in the community for her extensive knowledge and expertise in epilepsy healthcare and will begin the stakeholder engagement work with us later this summer. We cannot underestimate the power of collaboration. We as a community must work together for every one in 100 people living with epilepsy. Alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Everyone ending epilepsy. Everyone ending epilepsy. Everyone ending epilepsy. The time is now. Just check this works. Um, well, what a extraordinary evening. Um, learned so much, uh, and uh, it's just been inspiring and humbling. Um, my name's Andrew People. I'm a, a journalist by by, by my profession, and um, it's been my pleasure, um, particularly over the COVID period, to work with the team at ER UK, at Epilepsy Research UK, uh, particularly on some of the, the webinars uh, that they've been doing. Um, it's an organization, it's a charity that means a lot to me and my family. Um, I lost my um, sister to epilepsy nearly 20 years ago. And um, so it's just been wonderful for, for me and my family to see 
uh, and learn so much about the research and the work that that goes on um, to to investigate and and research uh, into into epilepsy. Um, with that in mind, um, having just watched that film in particular, um, it's very exciting to see that. Exciting to see the plans that are, are coming together. Um, it's absolutely what is needed to uh, radically change research into epilepsy. Um, so I, I want to add my congratulations to um, the team, Maxine and the team, uh, for taking the initiative uh, to, to drive such a, a pivotal program of, of work. Um, the time really is now, I think we can all agree. Um, in the video, we saw some of the themes that will enable this work, uh, one of which is data infrastructure. In my life as a journalist, we hear so much about uh, data these days. Um, so I thought it would be particularly interesting to delve into this uh, a, a little bit more with a, with a, a short panel, panel session now. Um, the term patient data can mean so many different things, can mean so many different things to different people. So let's um, ask the experts what it really means in practice. So if uh, the panel would like to, to come up and join me now and... Um... Um, I think you can see who they all are, but I'll give a, uh, a brief introduction. Uh, Professor Helen Cross, we all, we all know, has just spoken to us, the president of Epilepsy Research UK and the Prince of Wales Chair of Childhood Epilepsy at Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. Um, Dr. Gash Mbizu, uh, who's the specialist registrar in neurology at the Walton Centre in Liverpool, and he's been funded by Epilepsy Research UK. Um, Dr. Catherine Bush, congratulations, uh, Catherine, from Newcastle University this evening. She's been announced as uh, one of this year's emerging leader fellows. And Dr. Agnese Cataneo, who's the chief medical officer at Angelini Pharmaceuticals. So welcome to all of you and thank you so much for your time. I think we've got time for just one question really to each of you um, and hopefully time to throw it over to the audience as well. Catherine, can I start with you? Um, yes, grab a microphone. <laughs> thank you. Um, We've heard tonight a little bit about your exciting new research. Um, can you talk us through how important data is to you, how important data is towards ultimately saving lives? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for, <laughs> for having me, everyone. I think data is exceptionally important. And I apologize to people who are here this, this afternoon when we talked about it, because I'm going to repeat quite a lot of what I've, I said earlier. But the pandemic has been a global disaster, but what it has shown us really importantly is how amazing data research can be and how when the barriers come down and when people start working together and sharing data and working quickly alongside each other, just, just what we can achieve. And I think we've seen the use of real time data in the COVID situation to direct public policy, to direct um, <laughs> to direct um, public health care. It's been used to really individualise care. So we, the, the data in COVID allowed us to, to recognise which groups of people were most at risk, which groups of people should be prioritised for, for early care, who should be admitted to hospital. And it's just been an absolute revolution in terms of the use of data. And we need to we need to grasp that. We need to kind of not let that momentum go. And we need to continue that data sharing and move, move that data research to other areas. And I really feel that epilepsy is an area where it's absolutely right, absolutely right to, to start. Helen, um, in your work, there's been some real successes in the use of data for children with epilepsy. Um, can you talk us through what's happened there and what we can learn from this in particular? Well, I suppose that the best example to date has been um, 
the audit that has been set up um, through the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health and um, HQIP, which is Epilepsy 12, which started off as a retrospective audit, um, collecting data from all children with new diagnosis with epilepsy in England, originally Scotland, but England and Wales now. Um, and where they looked at initially 12 key indicators from the NICE guidelines to look at outcomes at the end of 12 months. And this audit is now reported three times. And what it shows is where improvements can be made, essentially. How are we really achieving those targets? And how can you know, we make a difference? And it has shown where improvements need to be made in the care of children with epilepsy, that we're not achieving those targets, even in that initial phase of new diagnosis. But what it's moving to, of course, as time has gone on and the work that's been done by the team is it's going towards a prospective data collection that could then possibly be shared we can gain more information, move it to a situation where um, individuals will have their own data, be able to compare it with other data, and so really make a difference to overall care, both at a, a national level, but also at an individual level. But there are also so many other aspects, you know, as we move to electronic health records, as individuals are able to share even imaging, for example, one of the projects that, um, and that has been awarded tonight is actually you know, collecting lots of imaging data to, to try and find, um, use it to look and find whether you can retrospectively find areas of abnormality that might be surgically amenable, for example. You know, collaborating in collecting data, get, get, um, collecting data in a standardized way with electronic health records, we can gain more information about more individuals with the same condition, and that can make a difference as we move forward with treatment. So much power and uh, potential power in the use of data and, and and the sharing of data. Gatch, your research in Scotland has, has focused on a very serious issue, which is data on the epilepsy related uh, deaths there in Scotland. Um, how can we learn from this data to prevent future epilepsy related deaths? Sure, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, yeah, I think we saw earlier that um, the, the data out there on how to prevent mortality in epilepsy and what intervention works is, is still limited. And I think we need to go back to the fundamentals here. You know, it, 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 the prerequisites for prevention, we need to understand the problem and be able to predict it. Uh, and this is what we've been looking to try and do, you know, at the Merrill Max Epilepsy Center here in Edinburgh. And we, we looked at mortality between 2009 and 2016. We had just over 2,000 epilepsy related deaths in Scotland alone. Um, and what we see is that over that time, mortality did not reduce. And actually, people are dying young. Um, and anywhere between the ages of 16 to 54, the mortality was between two and six times increased compared to the age-matched counterparts. And a substantial proportion were potentially avoidable, nearly 80%. So this helps us characterize the nature of this problem. Um, and we see that there were some service issues with this. So nearly 60% of those who were deceased had had some contact with a &E or hospital in the five years leading up to death, yet only 30% had had an a attendance in a neurology clinic. So these were not translating to, to the, these acute service um, admissions weren't translating to neurology care. And so the next question is, how do we use data to, to predict? Um, and, and I'll give an example. If you go to your GP now, uh, at, you know, at a certain age, you, your GP will calculate through um, your, your weight, um, whether you smoke or not, whether you've got diabetes and your BMI, what your cardiovascular risk is over the next 10 years. And that's been defined, that's been identified through using more national studies using data. It's actually a 1997 study. So these are big data sets that are going to be used for risk prediction. Now, why doesn't that exist in epilepsy? Well, maybe that's what we need to now do in epilepsy. So can we use can we create a risk prediction score for epilepsy, which we've tried to do in, in, in Edinburgh and we're working on this, or what we'd call um, the, 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 well, a, a risk calculation for epilepsy mortality. And we see that the sorts of things that we look at was whether you've had an a &E admission uh, in the last year um, to do with epilepsy, or whether you're from poor areas um, in Scotland, uh, and whether you've got a congenital reason for epilepsy. And if you put those in, we see that for each one that you acquire, you go from nine to uh, three times increased risk to then 15 times increased risk with two of them and 19 times increased risk with three of them of mortality. So we start to see whether we can stratify based on this 
a group of people who we could then direct interventions towards. And I think this is what's needed really in, in, in epilepsy is actually to improve our care. And in order to do that, to try and figure out which areas of these disparities and which way data can help us uh, achieve those goals. Um, so I think the study will help us in that way. Yeah, no, thanks so much for that that work you're doing. It sounds really so essential. And Yezi, can you talk to us from the pharmaceutical industries point of view, how data can inform the work that you do and how it can in, in fact help with uh, drug development, of course, very important aspects of all of this. Yeah, thanks, uh, Andrew, and uh, let me thank uh, for uh, us being uh, here. So Angelini is uh, someone would say new player in the epilepsy field since uh, uh, we have a long history in uh, brain uh, health in terms of our commitment, but uh, we are just learning in epilepsy. So thanks a lot for this um, opportunity. Um, so I think it's uh, fundamental at this moment. I mean, I'm happy that Gersh uh, mentions uh, some other condition, which probably also in the past, thanks to the different epidemiology and learnings and whatever other reasons were more advanced in looking into big numbers, let me say, in terms of data. Uh, but now I think we are in a, in a, in a condition in which we can really uh, make sure that uh, we can capitalize, uh, you know, an amount of data, either in, in the direction of precision medicine, which to me is the next frontier for, for us in developing drugs, because obviously we want to, to help the broader population po possible, the broadest population possible, but still we want to make sure that we are targeting targeting in the best way single patients of course then i think also what has been already mentioned in terms of prediction so and preventive and predictive medicine i would say uh, that's something we can we can definitely uh, you know consider with this uh, you know new approach if i think uh, i mean in the past the way we were doing uh, research and not that you know, a long time ago, but till a few years ago, it was, uh, now it seems quite obsolete, right? It seems that it was too too old way. And, and the very critical point to me here is that going into these paths, not only with researchers and, and uh, um, with uh, all of us, but also with the regulatory, um, you know, um, bodies, because sometimes it's not easy also for us to really uh, try to, uh, you know, capitalize some of the data which we really trust and we know that they are real life from one side and they're real data, then to make sure that they can help uh, you know, and can be read by regulatory in a way that can speed up also the process of uh, getting access to patients in need. So, but I think, I mean, I'm quite excited uh, uh, on this because also with this uh, cooperation we are having, I think we will uh, also look into data differently from now onwards, right? Thanks to artificial intelligence rather than uh, internet of things, of medical things and so on. We have, you know, uh, quite an interesting uh, journey. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm looking at James. Have we got time for a, a um, question or two? We're like to say, I think we're pretty much out of time. Is that a hate to comment to an end? Maybe one more question or more do you say? We have one more question for the audience. Yes. Audience, so yeah, absolutely. So maybe uh, if somebody's got a question now uh, that we could quickly <laughs> quickly ask, if, if you do, uh, please, please raise your hands. Otherwise, obviously, Ah, yes, please, over there. Are you in touch um, with any services such as Powerflow or AWS when it comes to data collection on a large scale? Um, who would like to take that? Anyone? Helen? Or... <laughs> I think... <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I think the answer is there are certain places that are in touch with those. That, you know, when we're collecting data within the NHS, when anything that we collect has to go through the strict, rigid... Um, rules, uh, the, 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 the security issues, but th the answer is yes, um, but it's not being used widely, but it is being used for um, certainly um, some of the patient groups are very keen on moving towards that. Thank, thank you so much for your question. I think um, thank you so much to all of the, the, the panelists here for that, those quick insights into, into the work that you're doing and how important data is. My wife who's here will tell you uh, how I'm just totally hopeless when it comes to science, but I always love to listen to scientists explain 
their work and how they go about their work and the the important uh, tools that that, uh, that they they must have. So thank you to all of you, and I think I'm handing back to uh, Matthew at this stage. Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for all the contributors. It's really been an evening that's challenged both uh, the brain and heart, I have to say. Um, and I really appreciate it as a researcher to understand better, really, the people who stand behind the research that I do. Um, so, last time to thank you all very much for coming, um, and would like to welcome you, well, welcome you, <laughs> say goodbye to you with drinks and canopies, uh, which will be happening afterwards. Uh, but just before that, we have a very brief film uh, from our lovely Doug. Mum and Dad was always just like, as long as you're happy. Especially when I got done school, because everyone, like, they kind of knew what they were going to do. They got an apprenticeship, and they got this and that, and I was kind of like, head up in the clouds. Tharsala is on the north coast, the very flat bit at the top of Scotland before you hit the Orkney Islands. Like you can see how people don't like it and they just want to get out of there. But like a lot of people are like, oh, what do you do up there? You got to make yourself busy. You got to get stuff done yourself. I was always in the water when I was young. Mum said I was always like down on the beach. I'd just be naked straight in the sea. And then I found a surfboard. I was like, holy shit, this is, I'm in. And it went downhill from there. <laughs> I think there's more passion if you learn to surf in the cold because you have to want it that little bit more. Just paddling out, that makes you like, wow. Makes you feel it. And then everything that goes along with it is just, just undescribable. <laughs> it's not always obvious when you have kids and they're growing up and you suddenly think, oh my God, I've created a really, really respectable, nice adult. It's quite amazing. You kind of be prouder than watching your kids succeed at something they love. I reckon I'll always be here just because first least it's a drug. Oh, my God.